Hi everyone, my name is Ruth Mormon and today I'll be stepping you through some work that I did as a student at the Australian National University with Adele Morrison and Andy Hogg. So in this work we're interested in understanding the effect of meltwater from Antarctic land ice on Antarctic ocean circulation. This freshwater flux has increased in the observed period as the melting of marine terminating ice shelves has accelerated and is projected to increase further under global warming scenarios. However, not a lot is known about how this increasing freshwater flux could impact near Antarctic Ocean processes. One big outstanding question in particular is how might this freshening affect the temperature of water masses on the continental shelf and the temperature of waters that come into contact with the ice sheet itself? This question is of particular interest and importance, as you might imagine, as resolving it could reveal thermal feedbacks whereby ice melt could drive future further ice melt. So studies have attempted to address this question in the past with various modeling perturbation experiments. I've just got three examples up here. Generally, these studies have used coupled climate models with a relatively coarse ocean component, these ones ranging from one to three degrees in the ocean grid. And one fairly consistent result that has come out of studies like this is that freshening of near Antarctic waters acts to stratify the ocean around Antarctica and trap heat in the subsurface, leading to ocean warming. In particular, this warming is simulated close to the Antarctic continental shelf. And the closeness of this warming signal to the continental shelf has led to the interpretation that this warming is significant for the ice sheet and it's significant for future ice shelf melt. One of the problems with interpre interpreting the results of these sorts of modeling studies in this way is that the coarse ocean components of these models do not resolve the small scale dynamics on the continental shelf and at the continental shelf margin that tend to dictate the water mass characteristics of shelf waters and therefore dictate uh, the characteristics of the waters that the ice sheet itself comes into contact with. So these unresolved uh, shelf margin processes, they include the Antarctic slope front, which uh, maintains a strong lateral gradient and temperature and salinity between the shelf waters and the open ocean waters around Antarctica. They also include the formation and export of dense shelf waters, which is important not only for global overturning studies, but also because it involves a lot of exchange of open ocean and shelf waters at the continental shelf margin. And another thing that it might include, for example, is um, eddy-driven transport of warm open ocean circumpolar deep waters onto the shelf. So to demonstrate the importance of these continental shelf margin dynamics, I'm just showing here a map of temperature at 500 metres around Antarctica from one of our higher resolution ocean simulations. And you can see that there are some really strong contrasts between the water mass properties on the shelf and the water mass properties directly off the shelf. What this should really highlight in your mind is that the response of the open southern ocean to perturbations is not necessarily the response that is going to be felt by the Antarctic ice sheet. Since the ice sheet is effectively insulated from the open ocean, by this microcosm of unique dynamics that is the Antarctic continental shelf and its continental margin. So a question that then arises is, if we did some perturbation experiments where we increased the flow of fresh water off Antarctica with, with models that resolve some of these processes, would we still see the same warming feedbacks that have been found in these coarser coupled climate models? So that's really the question that we wanted to address with this study. So in order to get there, we of course needed an ocean model to work with. So we've used Access OM201, which is a ocean and sea ice model at one tenth of a degree, which around Antarctica, that ranges from about two to four kilometers in the horizontal grid. It's forced by a, a repeat year atmospheric forcing that's extracted from the Jerego Godot product. And all of that is just to really keep the rest of the system as constant as possible and isolate the response of the ocean to the prescribed forcing as much as we can. So the model has a number of key advantages that really recommend it for use in near Antarctic perturbation studies. And the first of these is that the model does a really good job at representing those different dynamical regimes that can occur at the continental shelf margin. So here I'm showing a bit of a comparison between a classification scheme that was developed and put forward by Andy Thompson et al 
that splits the split stretches of the continental shelf margin up into different regimes that may either be dominated by the Antarctic slope front or the overflow of dense shelf waters or the absence of an Antarctic slope front. And you can see that the control simulation of our model is doing a pretty good job at replicating those patterns. So a particularly encouraging subset of this success is that the model does a really good job at simulating dense shelf water overflows and the formation of abyssal waters um, from continental shelf sourced dense waters, which is really exciting to see. So to have a look at that in a little bit more detail, um, if we have a look at this map on the right, the red colors on the continental shelf, I'm showing rates of surface water mass transformation into down downwelling density classes. And we can see that we're seeing downwelling in all of the regions on the Antarctic continental shelf, which we would expect to see the formation of Antarctic bottom water precursors. And then off the shelf, what I'm showing is um, an idealized age tracer normalized by the experiment length. Uh, in the bottom cell of the model, so right next to the bathymetry. And you can see that there is a signal of comparatively young or recently ventilated waters in green basically flowing along the bottom of the ocean right next to the bathymetry and getting into really abyssal regions of the ocean. As a bit more of a quantitative representation of the success here, um, this plot here on the left is showing us the volume transport across the Antarctic continental shelf margin, here represented by the 1000 meter isobath. So all volume transport across this isobath integrated along the isobath and then also integrated in density space so that we can see just the net density structure of um, the waters that are exchanged, exchanged across this contour. And what we can see is that there is a net offshore flow of around 10 sphere drops of um, very dense waters that is compensated by a net onshore flow by comparatively of comparatively lighter waters that can be split up into circumpolar deep waters and surface waters. So all of this is effectively just to show that the model is doing a really good job at representing some of the processes that occur at the continental shelf margin that are generally really hard to resolve and not very successfully represented in ocean models. So it gives us a bit of reassurance that we're making a good choice um, for near Antarctic, near Antarctic studies. All of that being said, it is of course not a perfect model, nothing is a perfect model, uh, and some of the key simplifications that are relevant to our study and our results is that meltwater is put into the model in a very unrealistic manner. Um, instead of being input at depth and interacting with an ice shelf cavity, meltwater is just input at the surface of the model. Um, effectively like river runoff. So what did we do with this fancy model? Um, I won't go into too many of the details, but effectively what we did was run two 10 year long perturbation experiments where we amplified the runoff coming off Antarctica by about 1.5 times the baseline and 2.8 times the baseline. Uh, we And we've perturbed it in a stepwise manner and run it parallel to the control simulation. I'll only just point out that there is some spatial pattern to the um, perturbation in that we only apply the amplification factors to ice shelves um, in regions in West Antarctica where ice shelf thinning has been observed in recent decades. What did we find? I'm going to start with the mean thermal response of the continental shelf, so really zooming out and having a look at the kind of net heat budget of this continental shelf region and how it's affected by, by the perturbations that we apply. So to first order under the control simulation, the heat budget of the continental shelf region is that heat is evicted into the region across the continental shelf margin and lost to the atmosphere from surface cooling. So this, this is just illustrating in a simple way what we understand about the near Antarctic region as that region of heat loss to the atmosphere. So the response that we might anticipate based on previous coarse resolution models is that as this region freshens, it becomes stratified and we see a reduction in this surface cooling term. And indeed we do see that in this model. 
But the element that is not captured by the coarse resolution models is that in parallel to this reduction in surface cooling, we also see a reduction in the advective heating of the shelf region. So the net effect is that the volume average temperature on the shelf initially increases over both experiments as the reduction in the surface cooling term dominates, but then we see a switch later in the experiment such that the reduction in the advective heating term starts to dominate, and in the end we're left with a slight negative uh, temperature anomaly. This temporarily variable trend on the continental shelf is in contrast to what we see just off the continental shelf on the continental slope region. So here I'm referring to waters between the 1000 meter and the 3000 meter isobaths. Waters in these regions consistently warm over the entirety of both experiments and this warming is due to that de decrease in the advective heat transfer from the open ocean to the continental shelf. As soon as we move away from this spatially average picture, our results get a lot more complex and we can see that there's a lot of spatial variability in, as to both the sign and the magnitude of the temperature response on the continental shelf. So here we're looking at the depth average temperature anomaly over the final year of the experiments and we can see that there are regions of extreme heating, extreme cooling and that there, there are some variations between the smaller and the larger perturbation experiments. So we wanted to dig into this and determine what the driving mechanisms are that determine both the sign and the strength of the temperature response in different stretches of the continental shelf. And we approached this question by looking at regional heat budgets, analyzing the shelf break structures or the shelf break regimes that, that uh, dominate the dynamics in different regions and also looking at different current systems. And what we came up with is three uh, three mechanisms that drive the thermal response on the continental shelf in our experiments. The first response is the one that we expected, so stratification, which leads to warming. And we especially see this signal in regions where we previously had dense shelf water related convection and where this has declined under fresh water forcing. The second place that we see this heat is off the shelf and the continental slope. And this brings me to the second mechanism, which is the decline in invective heat transport from open ocean waters to the continental shelf. And the mechanism behind this is that as continental shelf waters continue to freshen, the lateral density gradients associated with the Antarctic slope front strengthen. And this strengthening front acts to impede the transport of open ocean waters, uh, from warm waters to the shelf uh, as it has to cross many isopycnal barriers to get there. And I'll just add here as a note that the Antarctic slope front is geostrophically ba balanced by the Antarctic slope current, so that we find that over the course of our experiments, westward currents around Antarctica, both the Antarctic slope current and also currents uh, poleward of the, of the slope current, uh, so the coastal current, accelerate strongly over the course of the experiment. Now, the balance between these two mechanisms effectively explains the net heat budget of the continental shelf region. However, there's a third mechanism associated with these accelerating currents that helps that is needed to explain some of the spatial distribution of the signals that we see on the shelf. So the accelerating westward currents, both at the shelf break and along the coast, effectively act to homogenize Antarctic continental shelf waters, which can lead to strong warm and cool anomalies in different spots along the shelf. The most striking place that we see this is in West Antarctica, where around the West Antarctic Peninsula, we, we see a complete switch in the direction of the mean flow, where under control conditions, we have uh, a small a small flow of warm waters from West Antarctica to the Weddell Sea, and under perturbed flow we can have up, we build up to a very large flow in the opposite direction of cool Weddell Sea waters flowing into West Antarctica. Essentially, what we see here is that Weddell Sea waters become increasingly buoyant and no longer flow uh, off the continental shelf to form Antarctic bottom water, but instead are diverted into this accelerating along shore flow and act to cool West Antarctica. So in summary, we found that this highly spatially and temporally variable thermal signal on the Antarctic continental shelf in response to coastal freshening was the result of a combination of three 
three different mechanisms. The stratification of waters, the isolation of shelf waters from open ocean waters, and the homogenization of shelf waters. So there are a couple of community takeaways that I want to highlight at the end here. So the first of these is that in our simulations we found some really strong remote feedbacks really highlighting the importance of resolving the entire circumpolar domain if you're interested in land ice interactions and projections of, of land ice forward. The second one is that we found a lot of the thermal signals on the shelf are really dependent on the proximity of a region to dense shelf water convection and changes in dense shelf water convection. And this is a process that's very much under-resolved in, in global models. So just to highlight that, that, that that's a really interesting outcome of this research. Um, so these slides are a little bit old. This work has actually been published now in Journal of Climate. So if you're interested in some of those details, please do go have a look at that and get in contact uh, with me or my co-authors for more information. Thank you.